A little over 10 years ago, I decided to make photography my full-time career. I'm so glad that I did. I don't have any regrets, but I did make some serious mistakes along the way, especially when I first started out shifting from another career into being a full-time photographer. It stunned a lot of people why I even decided to choose photography. I went into real estate and architecture photography full-time about 10 years ago. I had been doing photography part-time before that, and I'd always had photography as a hobby, a lot of people looked at it like, well, is that just a pipe dream that I have? I had a successful career as an engineer, so why would I shift into that? Well, as cliche as it sounds, it was to pursue my passion. I wanted to have a full-time career as a photographer, but like everything else that you first start at, and going pro will make some mistakes. So I'm gonna share the top seven mistakes with you that I found along the way that if I knew then what I know now, my journey would have been a lot smoother and I hope this helps you as well. So the first two mistakes here, they're related to money and the first one especially, that's number seven, and that's that you don't need to buy expensive gear. Now, when I first got into doing professional photography, my first thought was, my gosh, well, I'm doing this professionally, I need to get the highest end camera. That's not true. Even today, shooting Nikon, I use the Z5 bodies. I don't use Z9 or Z8. The Z5 full frame bodies, 24 megapixel, are more than enough than what I need to do professional real estate and architecture photography. If I were doing sports, yeah, I'd wanna have faster autofocus. I'd wanna have a higher frame rate so that I can shoot in bursts of 50 frames per second. But I'm shooting on a tripod and uh, doing architecture stuff that is not really requiring a high frame count. So I don't need to have the best camera, I need to have a good camera. And as cliche as this will sound, it's not the camera, it's the photographer. Now, there that's not entirely true because you do need to have a good enough camera to get good quality pictures. You do need to work on improving your skill set, but there's a happy medium. So I used to use just some D610 bodies. After I realized I don't need to be buying the latest, greatest gear out there, I moved into doing the, my work on mirrorless cameras because it sped up my workflow, mainly from having the WYSIWYG view on the back screen. I can see things in real time. That sped things up, especially dialing in white balance and whatnot, exposure, and also doing flash photography, getting some better feedback as I'm working with it. So things like that did help with buying better gear. It improved my workflow, but I didn't have to break the bank doing that. Once again, the big mistake is not concentrating on your skills before getting the better gear. And this leads into some of our other mistakes because what happened was once I really got properly geared up and I had things flowing, I got very excited about it. And so what I did was I was starting to share what I learned on YouTube. That's the YouTube channel that you're watching right now. I had tried a lot of stuff. I had tried doing HDR photography and whatnot and went through the pains of all that. Once I learned some things about doing flambient, darkened mode window pulls, things like that in real estate photography that make it easy but really good quality photos out of it, I wanted to share all that here. I didn't become a YouTuber to make money. You don't make much money off YouTube. That's not why I did this. You can see by my subscriber count, I'm not in the millions, I'm not even at 100,000. What, I right now about 78,000, I think, subscribers. So I appreciate every single one of you that watches these videos and all that. But the thing was, I didn't do this to get into it. I didn't do it for the money on the YouTube side of it. I was very excited about it. It's a sign of the passion that I had. Now, yes, I did come up with books. I came up with online courses to learn real estate photography. That was born out of this YouTube channel because I was getting a lot more requests for training material to learn how to do this. But the thing was, it was a matter of gearing up, getting myself properly situated into a good workflow, and then there was a passion that came out of it that turned into all this other training material. Now, I still work 
full time as a real estate photographer. But before getting on to these other mistakes, let me just mention though, if you are interested in actually learning real estate photography, then you might want to take a look at my courses and my books. I have links to that all down in the description for this video. My online courses, I've got courses on doing professional interior photography, expert editing on interiors, exterior photography, and also videography for real estate. And I've also written best-selling books on real estate photography as well. So let's move along to the next one. And at number six, this is a huge one that I see so many people make. I made this mistake starting out. It has to do with your marketing budget and getting clients. Now, you get into doing photography so you can have clients, but you don't want to pay for them right up front, especially. So when you're into something like real estate photography, you can get a lot of repeat business. If you're doing weddings, you're doing portrait photography, that's also a referral basis. And this is where you differentiate two different types of photographers. On one hand, you'll have photographers that have to market constantly. So they're after high volume work, turn and burn. In the real estate industry, what we find is that there's about, I think the statistic is 75% of realtors don't make it past two years because it's so tough. In that, that's a, a very drastic case that really shines light on this example that when you have these people that aren't really getting much work, they're very budget conscious about it, they're not gonna be paying your bills for very long. So if you're constantly getting those type of clients, they're turn and burn. They're here, they're gone. They're here, they're gone, that's it. And they're also gonna pay less. So you're constantly marketing, constantly marketing. You have this marketing budget to just keep yourself busy. But if you work off a referral basis and you slowly start building those clients by selectively picking out a couple, it's something I'm gonna to get to here in just a second. Once you do that, then you get referrals. Today, I work entirely off referrals. It's very rare that I take on a new client. A lot of times I send that off to my backup photographer because my schedule is so full. And it started by correcting this mistake that I should not be out there blasting on Instagram and Facebook and reaching out to all these clients and hoping for the best. No, that doesn't work that way. You need to keep your budget very low when it comes to marketing and be smart about it on how you target those particular clients. And it's another mistake that I'm gonna to get to here shortly, but before then, the pivotal point, and it's really the next mistake, is that too many photographers will discount their quality. What I mean by that is that you don't want to lower your quality. You want to be able to provide extremely high quality photos. And I don't care what the genre is. And maybe passport photos, that might be different. But when it comes to even real estate, you'll hear a lot of photographers go, don't worry, it's temporary media. It's just going to be for listing. People look at this on their phones. They won't care. That is wrong for a lot of reasons. You've probably heard me talk about this on other videos. And that's the the media itself that you provide is also how you're going to be referred for future work. You need to stand out so that when someone sees your work, they're like, oh my gosh, and they can't stop talking about it. Also, what will happen is, especially like in real estate, is that when a real estate agent goes to sell a house, when they are actually pitching their wares themselves as being the representative to sell a particular property, they have to prove that they work with professionals. They'll usually have a portfolio showing these are the vendors that I work with and also online. If somebody saw that so-and-so had sold a property down the street and it had cell phone pictures or awful quality, they're gonna think, well, who, they're gonna represent my property? That's the type of mentality that any client will have in any genre. I don't care if it's weddings, I don't care if it's sports, I don't care what the genre is. There's gonna be a mentality where they want to find the best, highest quality photographer and that can lead to more pay. So let's move on to the next mistake and that is don't undercharge for your work. If you're providing good quality work, charge for it. My rule of thumb has always been if you wanna know what to charge for real estate photography or real estate videography, find out what your competition is charging and you charge more. Now, what that means is you need to prove that you're better than your competition, not just in quality, but also responsiveness and other aspects of customer service. So yes, you should learn how to not just do good photography, you should learn how to do really good editing and you should have really good customer support as well.
Once you achieve those goals, yes, increase your prices, be the most expensive photographer out there, you'll make more money. You're not gonna get the cheap one and done clients, you're gonna get repeat business because you're able to prove that you're the quality photographer in your area. Which leads to the next mistake, and that is that you should be choosing your clients wisely. It's not the other way around. So there's this mentality that if you provide a service, you should just put an ad out there and hope for the best. People will call you and you go do their work. Well, when it comes to photography and, and really any sustainable business, sometimes you need to seek out your clients. You're not McDonald's just blasting everybody and people will just show up, stand in line, and they just order French fries and a Coke. When they're really wanting something good, then you sometimes have to seek that, that client out. So you need to do your own homework and then target those clients in your area with your pitch. So you don't wanna just pitch to anybody and everybody. You need to make sure that clients are sustainable, that they seem to have a good reputation. You can find out a lot of this online. You can go onto Zillow.com, Realtor.com, or whatever it is, and you can start finding if these clients are selling homes in your area, if they don't even represent any sellers yet. They don't know what they're doing, right? Now, it's a little bit harder when you're in other genres of photography and you're doing, like, for instance, weddings or sports or whatnot, but still, you're gonna be contacted by people. And a simple search on any social media will re reveal a lot about them, but this is also then where referrals come in. So think of photography as a referral business, not just a blast it to the masses, but one where people are looking to seek out you because you've done such a great job. So that's where referrals come in, it's very huge. So make sure though that you're very selective of your clients. And I wanted to mention something here, is that when people say, well, how do I go out and get new clients? Well, I don't, I'm, I've hit my maximum capacity when it comes to new clients. Now, very rarely, I take on a new client. Usually if I do, it's through referral basis. Because I'm so overloaded, I have a backup photographer and he also does my drone work. And I also have another photographer I'm connected with who's down in Los Angeles. So when I'm too busy, I can offload my work to these other people. But my marketing budget, it's zero. And it's been that way for years. I stopped paying a long time ago for all these email blasts and trying to do Facebook ads and all this. It just doesn't work. So what you need to do is build your skill set, prove that you can do it, and I hate to say it, but it's one of those things of build it and they will come. So work on your skill set, be selective of who you take on as a client, and that leads into mistake number two, and that's that you need to provide add-ons early. That way you can offer these services, and a lot of times the add-ons aren't even selected by a lot of clients. They're always gonna wanna have photos, but if you don't at least provide these other add-ons, then they might not wanna have necessarily you as their go-to vendor because you don't provide everything that they might need for an upcoming listing. So think about that. Now moving on then to the top one, to the number one mistake that I learned from is that you should never become satisfied with your work. You need to always improve. I am still improving to this day. I'm in my 60s now <laughs> and, and I've been doing this a long time but I still question my work almost every day. I'm very careful of it, and yes, I get anxiety of it, but that's healthy because it keeps me on my toes. It makes me want to improve. Every night, I am still reviewing my work. So after a day of shooting and editing, after I have family time and uh, we have dinner and all that, maybe watch a little bit of television, I do some reading, whatnot. Well, right before going to bed, I'll turn on my iPad and I'll flip through a little bit of my work and take another look at it, it's a fresh look, and I think to myself critically, if I were that client and I'm looking at this, am I happy with these pictures? What could I improve on? What could I do better? And I might make myself a few notes and realize these are my weak areas, that's what I need to work on. But no matter what, is that when you start realizing these various mistakes or other mistakes that you might be making, work to correct those and don't get down on yourself for them because things will get better over time if you take action and start improving yourself and don't make these mistakes going forward or at least don't make them as frequent.